Many of you will know that there is a, um, a philosopher by the name of E.J. Lowe, who is one of the foremost proponents of ontological thinking in the 20th century, and who wrote a book with the title The Four Category Ontology. And this, this talk now was presented originally at a meeting uh, devoted to E.J. Lowe's work, and it shows how BFO can be regarded as being a six-category counterpart of E.J. Lowe's four-category ontology. And we'll start with a short discussion of phantology. So many ontologists in the 20th century and many ontologists today, and many practitioners of a branch of philosophy called analytic metaphysics today, practice what I like to call phantology. And phantology is the view that the way to do metaphysics or ontology is to take predicate logic and to regard it as a mirror of reality already at the syntactic level. Now, predicate logic is based on using expressions made up of a, a capital F and a small a, where F stands for hungry or red or some other predicate, and A stands for Johnny or Obama or Donald. Um, and sometimes we have, so in other words, to say that Obama is hungry is expressed as hungry brackets Obama. And to say that, and we can do relations also, to say that Obama is hungrier than Donald would be hungrier in big letters brackets Obama comma Donald. So phantology is the view that the world is structured like that and uh, this is actually not a bad idea so first order logic is a really expressive formal logic with very nice formal properties and um, some of the best work in metaphysics in the early part of the 20th century was done on its basis and the philosophy of mathematics became a mature discipline because basically they tried to represent all of mathematics phantologically. Frege was a phantologist. And uh, so the, the most prominent example of phantology is David Armstrong's spreadsheet ontology. And what he said was that this could be used to create a picture of the world. We list all the predicates along the horizontal axis and all the proper names along the vertical axis. So we, we give a name to every single atom, every single boson, every single sense datum, anything which exists, we give a name to it. And then we list all the predicates that it possesses and eventually we will have I just did a fancy thing with the word. Eventually, we will have a complete picture of everything that exists. And this is nonsense. We'll, I mean, you have, we'd have to do the relations too, which would mean you would have a multi-dimensional version. But, but the, however you extend it with relations and so forth, you get nonsense. David Armstrong did much better work than this. And I'm not sure he ever actually took this seriously. Now, the reason why he took it seriously to the extent that he did was because if you're a phantologist, then you have to have perfect individuals which have a perfectly um, representable set of properties which you can capture in predicates and a perfectly representable set of relations which you capture in enary predicates where n is greater than 1. And so, to get the perfect objects, you need absolute simples. Now, the future science will have discovered what these absolute simples are, and everything else will just be a logical com construction on the basis of these absolute simples. And the absolute simples will look like the spreadsheet. That's what he was forced to believe because he was a phantologist. Um, and. So one slogan of the phantological kingdom is that all generality belongs to the predicate. So individuals do not have any individual 
characteristics. Sorry, individuals do not have any characteristics intrinsically, rather they have qualities uh, which are captured by predicates which are another I'm not sure what, even what word to use for this uh, in other words names should not have any meaning so Donald Trump does not have any meaning it could just as well be 14763-2 but scientists use nouns all the time which are full of meaning and always will do so. And so that suggests that there's something discordant as between phantology and science. If reality is made of atoms and we only have predicate logic to capture complexity, then there has to be um, a, a, a reductionist ontology that comes out of that because we can't, can't capture real complexity by meaning using nouns. We have to use predicates and logical combinations of predicates. So another term that they use is bare particulars. That the, these doctrines of bare particulars arose out of the, the logical implications of the phantological vocabulary. And, uh, and then Another way of putting this is that not only are there no complexes on the side of objects, there are also no properties on the side of predicates because um, properties are just a reflection of predication. Predication is a linguistic phenomenon. So, for Aristotle, on the other hand, there are predicates which capture something general on the side of the object. So, predicating the category of substance tells us that John is not a bare particular, he's a man, which is a complex object with a certain essence or nature. And then, on the other hand, there is predicating the category of accident, which gives us the non-intrinsic features of John. Accidental means non-intrinsic, means you can lose them. So you can be awake or you can be asleep. And so Frege didn't allow predication of the category of substance, and therefore, since Frege invented phantology, neither did the followers uh, in his footsteps. Okay, now we are beginning to get to uh, various brands of phantology. So there are nominalistic bland, brands which say that there are no properties. There are set theoretic brands which say that the, the predicates represent sets of the members, sets of the individuals which, of which the predicate holds. And then there are Platonistic versions of phantology which say that there are platonic properties. And um, this is David Armstrong. Uh, this is a two-category ontology which allows for bare particulars on the one hand and Properties, on the other hand, uh, properties are genuine universals, but for Armstrong, this is a more complicated story. There are neither particulars nor properties, really, because both of them are abstractions from what he calls states of affairs. But the spreadsheet ontology has a two-category structure like this. And, um, and if we want, we can make it slightly more sophisticated by adding in the relation. And this is the generic phantological ontology. So there are bare particulars and then there are attributes and we can enrich the particulars by having slightly more complex particulars and we can enrich the attributes by giving them platonic existence, for instance, or by recognizing them as Aristotelian universals. Yes? So this also doesn't capture um, like a any time relations? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. But it will. We need time. All right, so then there is Quine, who, for whom there are only individuals, and the attributes, there aren't really any sets either. So the, the only things which we quantify over are individuals. And then there are nominalists, and there are some more sophisticated nominalists who hold that there are both substantial, uh, substantial particulars and 
accidental particulars, but they're all particulars. There are no universals of any sort, no sets, no platonic entities, no universals, just particulars. And then there are people who want to have it all. Uh, Aristotle, Husserl, E.J. Lowe, I, I want all of this too. Um, and you see that, that this is predication in the category of substance. So the left-hand column tells us that this man instantiates the universal man. And going from the bottom left to the top right is predication in the category of accident. This man has a headache or this man has a suntan. Now, I, I didn't mention this when I was talking about sumo earlier, but sumo only allows predication in the category of accident. It, 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 uh, it doesn't allow headaches and suntans to exist. And when I argued with Adam Pease about this, he couldn't understand what I was getting at. So he is such a phantologist that he didn't understand that there could be such things as tropes. And he certainly didn't, un didn't uh, accept that there could be universals. So he, he has his F's, which are in the top right, and his A's, which are in the bottom left. And, um, and th th so I think the bottom left is primarily important because of medicine. All, all examples of diseases go in the bottom right. They don't go um, they don't go into the realm of universals. Now we can mention all, at this point ICD. ICD is the International Classification of Diseases. It's really an international classification of people with diseases. So the ICD is also an example of phantology for quite different reasons, which have nothing to do with Frege. All right, so Aristotle had two kinds of predication, and w that's what Husserl and Lowe are talking about. So we have objects which exemplify non-substantial universals, but those non-substantial universals are instantiated by particular properties or tropes, what E.J. Lowe calls modes and what Husserl calls individual accidents. Uh, sorry, Aristotle calls individual accidents. Husserl calls them individual moments. And my initial exposure to metaphysics was this diagram uh, as captured by Husserl in his logical investigation. And so non-substantial universals characterize substantial universals and particular properties characterize substantial particulars. So when I say somebody is hungry or heavy or, or, hung, or um, uh, suntan, then I'm characterizing that somebody. Uh, yes? Um, particular properties, would they be uh, of the tropes? Yeah. yeah. Tropes, modes, moments, individual accidents, concrete particulars, they're all no names for the bottom right-hand corner. All right, so we talked about all of that. And now we go to the six-category ontology. So what is missing from the four-category ontology is time or processes. And so we, and we have one-place processes like getting warmer, and we have relational processes like kissings and thumpings and conversations and dances and battles and so forth, crashes, explosions. And processes behave very much like qualities. They are dependent on their bearers or participants. And so this gives us the six-category ontology, uh, which is one basic uh, aspect of the similarity between BFO and Dolce. It's captured by an Australian realist metaphysician by the name of Brian Ellis, whose work I recommend. And I don't know what Lowe had against processes, whether he thought he could deal with them anyway, whether he thought that they were not uh, useful. Um, but 
I, I, again, I think in medicine, processes are just as important as diseases. And uh, so, now the, the, there are some people who only have processes. We can ignore them because they, they don't themselves believe that they exist. So Heraclitus didn't believe that Heraclitus existed. Um, then there are trope nominalists who believe in tropes and trope bundles, but who include processual things within the realm of tropes. And Peter Simons, again, is uh, the most articulate representative of a view like that. Quine, we've already seen, but Davidson, who from this point of view was a really great philosopher, um, he built in the events. So he had a trope theory only for processes. So that was a real break. That was a, he, he was, uh, from this perspective, that looks like an enormous advance. I think it's trivial, but from the perspective of 20th century analytic philosophy, where everyone really was a phantologist, Davidson make it, made a big step. He didn't realize it, how big it was. All right, so sumo, I will mention again, there are no headaches, no electric charge, charges, no ownership relations, no property rights. None of the things which go under quality particulars are allowed in sumo. He did allow events. So, so remember, there are processes and objects. They're the two major categories. Um, sumo has pre qualities also. Uh, which means they have quality instances and quality universals because, sorry, Dolce has qualities also because they have quality instances as well as quality universals. And the one characteristic of Dolce and BFO, which is a characteristic of all BFO uh, conformant domain ontologies, is that every term in the ontology has instances in reality. Now, many database um, architectures don't follow that rule. So in the database world they make a distinction between what they call abstract classes and concrete classes. Concrete classes have instances. Abstract classes don't have instances. I find it hard to understand too. Uh, so object doesn't have instances but person does and yet persons are objects. So surely every person is an instance also of object. That seems to me to be an obvious rule. But in the database world, that rule is broken systematically, annoyingly. Just where you would need the instances, you find they're not allowed. Um, all right. So that's the diagram now rewritten in the sixth category ontology way. So we still have exemplifies and instantiates. Now we have a new kind of instantiation, which is the instantiation between a process particular and a process universal. And we also have a dependence relation between the process particular and the objects participating in the process. And we have a, 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 uh, an involvement uh, or participation relation between those objects and the processes in which they participate. And you find this picture in a paper called Against Phantology, where I first expressed uh, the idea that the big problem with analytic philosophy generally and with analytic ontology in particular was the two-category ontology imposed by phantology. 